what's going on with a lot of landowners when they're thinking about entering the carbon markets. Um, so on one hand, we have an emerging uh, carbon market opportunity. In the last six years, volumes increased on average um, over time. And in 2011, the, the latest uh, reporting period for carbon value was the highest force offset value in the voluntary market. And so um, it's, it was valued at 237 million. It's pretty small, but there is mostly um, in these developed countries. There's not too many opportunities in the US, except for California's regulatory market. Um, California's regulatory market was signed into law by Arnold Schwarzenegger in 2006. And the goal is to um, reduce emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. Um, so, and these are capped at 20. Uh, Entities that emit more than 25,000 metric tons a year are capped, and they can meet some of their compliance obligation by buying offsets. So 8% of their compliance obligation, they can buy offsets. Um, there's four types of off off offsets that are eligible, and two of those are forestry. One is urban forestry, and one includes um, other types of project types, improved forest management, wood conversion, deforestation, reforestation. Um, and just to give you a scale, sense of scale, this potential market is between two and eight billion dollars between now and 2008 or 2010, the next seven years. Um, and that's about on par with USDA's conservation payments. So um, it could be a significant factor in um, land use management. The value right now is about $10, not really 12. It's more around nine or $10. Um, and some people projected um, average of $35 between now in 2020 when that cap ratchets down over time. I think that's high. I think you're probably likely to see $25 to $40 lower end on the $25 to $30. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't understand what, what is an offset. I mean, that's $10, $12 per what? Per metric ton. OK, so that's yep. what I wasn't getting. Was that oh, carbon or CO2? Of CO2E. So yeah, so it's equivalent. So other projects that don't, you know, it's whether it's um, an anxious oxide or something like that, they use CO2E as equivalent. So this is CO2E. And they're called CCOs. And actually, just digging into the offset world a little bit while we're there, the, the forestry um, um, offsets might be valued a little bit higher than other offsets like livestock. Not really because of their environmental attributes, their co-benefits, but because it has a lot to do with the legal liability of um, the, the if there's a reversal in the future, if there's a problem with the project, the liability is on the landowner. For other projects, it's actually on the people buying and selling. So it's a liability issue that actually get a dollar or two more per ton. Um, so environmental impacts. There are co-benefits with forestry projects, forestry offset projects. This is a project I'm working on in the Dominican Republic, focused on migratory bird habitat conservation. Actually, it's a migratory bird, the big nels thrush that flies from Vermont here in New York down to the Dominican Republic and over winters. Here's a project that was part of the research uh, grant uh, where a land trust purchased land in Maine and they're using, trying to use carbon um, credits or offsets as a finance mechanism for salmon habitat um, or to conserve the, the, the buffers essentially. And then there's another project in Maine um, that's mature old growth forest, so instead of biodiversity in a, vertical and horizontal structure means. Um, and then just to point out, this is a project that I'm working on in the um, southwest, and you can harvest with carbon projects. So it is multi-use. Um, it's not just leaving it forever wild. So you can combine you know, harvesting and carbon payments. Um, depending on your modeling and how that net benefit is each year, you know, that, that's, that depends on the management. You can harvest, I just wanted to point that out. And then, so there's environmental benefits, and then the policy implications is forest offsets are low bait, um, low bait um, opportunity to reduce emissions, essentially. What does that mean? Basically, they're low cost um, opportunity. You can provide forestry offsets at a lower cost than other um, offsets from other sectors, essentially. So this is a McKinsey curve. And essentially what this says is, okay, your lowest cost opportunities are down here. These are kind of your win-wins. This is the energy efficiency. You reduce your emissions, but you also save money on your energy bill. And then it breaks out here to the, it's more expensive or it does cost something, but how cheaply can you provide 
by the forces around here. I think there's a degree of restoration. It's on the lower end. So from a policy standpoint, forestry credits um, can provide a cost-effective cap and trade um, market. Another thing I wanted to point out, California's market, um, any landowner in the U.S. is eligible. So you can buy up, you can sell your offsets from Maine, Vermont, Maryland, Alaska, um, all 50 states. Is that what, is that what Maine was doing? They were selling their markets to California? They exactly. Using the revenue. Exactly. Yep. So, um, and then the Northeast, so how does that kind of um, relate to the Northeast? So in the first time since the 19th century, we actually have a, a decline in forest cover here in the Northeast. Um, for the past 100, 150 years, we've been on a, on a positive growth on forest cover. Um, so this is due to um, urban um, sprawl um, and mostly, yeah, mostly sprawl parcelization. So this could be, you know, incentive to keep your forest intact, reduce the parcelization effects, fragmentation, et cetera. So it's tree cover or forest cover? Because those are different things and they point in different directions. It should be forest cover. I think canopy cover. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Um, so what's the problem? There's an opportunity. There's a market. There's co-benefits. Um, you know, the problem's there. Why, why isn't everybody jumping off their seats right now and selling their credits to California? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of barriers to participation. One is that the market's early. So it is, it is in compliance right now, um, but products are just starting to be listed. Another thing is there's no free lunch. I mean, people think, oh great, this is gonna be $35 per ton, maybe that'll be like $70, let's say two metric tons per acre, we'll say. 70 bucks an acre, I'm gonna have, you know, a, five, a thousand acre project, that's some good money per year. Well, you realize that once you start getting the program, and you do the inventory, do the project documents, do the third party verification, you're looking at a price between $100,000 and $200,000. I've worked on projects over $500,000, and it's just it's because you're trying to meet a stringent protocol that's open to the public. So you have people on the left side criticizing because it's not stringent enough, and then people on the right side that think that, um, that it's not stringent enough, and people on the left that don't like offsets, so they're criticizing it. So it has to be, it's, it's a compliance offset protocol, so it's very stringent. Um, it's expensive. Um, so a couple of people have looked at, so what, one thing is that, the, so like I just said, the protocol requirements can kind of influence how expensive these products are to develop. So some in the voluntary market are a little bit more open and less expensive. The compliance market's more stringent. So some people have looked at how these protocols affect the profitability of projects. Um, here's a couple right here, Gaelic and, and Foley. Um, and then Roy, well, the bottom point there, the voluntary market. Essentially, there's been assessments of the voluntary protocols. But to date, there haven't been any compliance protocol assessments to really say or see what factors affect the financial viability under California's market. So there's this big opportunity. You know, how big does my land have to be to be profitable? How large, I should say? What are the property characteristics? What's my stocking level? What sort of cultural treatments um, could, I, could I use? And then secondly, what are the protocol and legislative requirements um, and policy assumptions that affect the, the financial viability of the project? So those are the questions that we wanted to ask in our research. And really what this, when this came from, and when I'm doing consulting work, on the side, I'm that guy on the phone. I have people calling me saying, okay, I have 150 acres in Heinsberg, and I just, um, you know, I just, I just clear cut it. I want my credit, credit, um, you know, payments type thing to somebody that has 20,000 acres as a land trust and doesn't know how to actually enter the market. So I think there was a lack of information in the marketplace. So the idea and real goal was to provide a tool to landowners to act as a filter um, where they could assess the viability of their project. That was, these were the questions we wanted to answer in research. The, the, the practitioner in me wanted to give a tool to the landowners so they could use it to assess their own property. So we had 25 sites spending from the Adirondacks to Maine. Um, we did the inventory on every property. We used um, fixed uh, permanent, uh, fixed radius permanent plots. We used variable radius plots. We used a stratified systematic. Sampling design, um, it's us doing the plots there on the right, the 
carbon pool is above ground live, standing dead. Um, you calculate coarse roots, but that's through equations. You don't actually dig under the soil and measure them. And we did quality assurance, quality control. We measured about 10% of the plots. So we want to know what were the costs of developing these projects, and and then what's 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 the you know looking at property characteristics, what's driving that profit, that the financial viability. So we looked at silvicultural treatments. How does that impact carbon stock? How does management affect your your property and your and your financials? So we use uh, just to back up on that. So we use growth and uh, yield model called Forest Vegetation Simulator. Um, it's developed by U.S. Forest Service. It's one of the accepted growth yield models in California's protocol. It's widely used and established as a record of over 20, 30 years. Um, it's very well known. So we use that. Um, we also consider policy assumptions. This is one thing when I entered the research, I didn't really consider or think that would um, be part of the research, actually. So legislation. Right now, California's market starts starting a year ago, goes to 2020. What happens after 2020? Nobody knows really, right? There's something in there that says it may continue, but it's not, it's not, you don't know for sure. So in your modeling, your assumptions, do you model out past 2020? Because California requires you to monitor for 100 years after you sell your credits. So anyways, we had these policy assumptions built in, taking from a conservative approach to a less conservative approach. So kind of how risky do you want to assume uh, the policy would be moving forward? We did, um, I got the five minute warning, so I'm gonna slide a little bit through the methods here, but we did basically a regression analysis to look at um, the dependent variable being the modified internal rate of return of a property entering the market, okay? And then the independent variables or property characteristics, size, civil cultural treatments, who you certified, uh, what was your stocking, um, et cetera, and policy assumptions. So this is the result of that CART analysis, it's called. And what this does basically is identifies the number one predictor of financial viability. And this is stocking level. So how well stocked your forest is. So this is saying on average, forests that are about 40% above the regional average stocking level um, and choose a more, a less conservative policy, which means less monitoring costs, have an average internal rate of return of 23%. So you can kind of pick different paths here. You can go this way, okay, it's a smaller property. This is hectare, so they got cut off there. Um, you know, and you're getting 0 .08. So yeah, don't, if you have that size property, don't enter the market. Um, bottom line, you got three main predictors. Your policy, your stocking, and your property size. We Sorry, that, that rate of return is over how many years? That's by 2020, or what's the? It, it was actually, the crediting period is 25 years, so it'd be 25 years. 25. But if you monitor, if we get the monitor policies, yeah. you do have to assume it goes out. Right. Past that, because that's a good, you know, it's a cost. Um, so the reason the stocking is important is under the protocol, you get credit for being above the regional average um, U.S. Forest Service FIA, it's called Forest Inventory Analysis. So this is the, let's say this is the average in the region, this is your stocking level, you get the credits, um, the difference basically. So that's the, you know, that up in financials, when you're running like a net present value or a turn rate of return, you get your money back immediately. So being well stocked is very important. Um, we need new batteries. And then you get your annual credits, and those are the annual credits. Um, we want to look at cash flow, same story here, basically a combination of cash uh, property stocking and property size, because property size is obviously a, a driver. And you just look at here, so let's take a look at the first one, the cash flow for property that's 417 hectares, which is like over 1,000 acres. You know, well stocked, you get that money up front, and then you get the annuals. And essentially, at the end of the day, you know, these are profitable. These being the cash flow on a larger property but low stocked is the second one. Um, and same with the third one. It's a larger property, but it's less than 40% well stocked. You're not getting a return. You're not breaking even until like year six. So that's why that, that stocking level is so important for that upfront revenue. How does that happen? I'm sorry, I'm missing that point. There's, yeah. there's, there's an upfront that's going to a higher stocking level than anybody else. You get a payment, a greater payment up front. Exactly. Okay. I'm trying to go back here. Well, let me. The reason being is because you're above the regional average. Yeah. So if your stocking's up here, they're saying, you know what, you're a good actor. Yeah. So, you're good. And so it's a performance-based standard. 
it's not like the voluntary market where you ask your neighbor if you would have done this or that. It's no, it's what you do now and what is the average practice for that region. You get the delta pieces. Um, just a scenario analysis. Looking at um, on one end, you know, 1,500 acres with high initial sea stocking, uh, passive forest management, self-financed by the landowner was profitable. But on the other end, you know, low, low stocking, right? Below that regional common practice, active forest management, greater than 12,000 acres was not profitable. So there's a huge spectrum of profitability. Um, and just, this is a couple examples here. This is below that stocking level, you're below the regional average, um, and you're, active, you're practicing active management. It's, it is, in this example, it is profitable, but only at 12,000 acres. These are the, the ends mean no, not profitable. You finally hit at 12,000 acres. Um, and then this is the one that you're well stocked here. See how you hit it at 1,500 acres, you become profitable. And our benchmark was 25% modified internal rate of return, by the way. But one thing too is, are you financed by a developer or do you sell finance? So that break even is gonna be different because developers take 25, 30% of your, of your credits if they finance your project. Just another example to show the spectrum, that's at 3,000 acres. So the, the end of the day, take home message. Is it a panacea or Pandora's box? Like you probably expect it's somewhere in the middle. Um, it's not for everyone. It's not a free lunch. Um, they don't accept the aggregation protocol, that um, climate action reserve, which is the, the protocol developed basically for, AR, for California's market. They don't accept um, aggregation, so small scale lane owners will be um, precluded from the market until until they accept uh, something that allows them to, to reduce those transaction costs. Um, and one interesting finding was, really it's the, the re it's results of the interaction of the factors rather than one isolated variable that um, drives the profitability of projects. Um, one interesting thing is, is the potential reversals and the adverse effects on climate change. So if you assume in your modeling that policy ended in 2020, you have a high Total rate of return, high in PV, but what if it does end in 2020? Then you just basically go back to your business as usual, if you follow me. So basically there's no way to monitor that you're maintaining those stocks for long, long periods. So there is a potential adverse environmental impacts. Um, but it can provide revenue for landowners with greater than 1,500 acres, um, well-stocked, conservation-oriented, and willing to, to commit um, long-term. Contracts. It is a hundred year obligation. So, I want to thank the people that worked on the project with me Northeast States Research Cooperative and Carbon Dynamics Lab. So, I'm the moderator, so I'll take a couple of questions and then I'll, if they're too difficult, I'll just. Uh, So the risk answer is there's a buffer pool. So 20% of your credits go into a pool. It's like an insurance pool just for your house or your car. It goes into like a national pool. So if there's a risk of fire, um, you're covered. So that, that answers that question. And the first question about conservation. So there's a start date. So you have a year, if you put an easement in place, you have a year to put your project um, in the program. If you miss that, then, then you basically have to use that already conserved land as your baseline. You don't get any additional credits, basically. So there's a time timeline issue. So if you already conserved, you don't get the benefit of the marginal. Exactly, because it's already you've already done it. But um, what about state programs like Connecticut? We have a state program where there's tax advantages. Exactly. Would that right. also be precluded? From totally depends the on the state and, and what's in the management plan. But you're absolutely that time. I looked in that for 48 in New York and current use here in Vermont. It really depends. Okay. There, it, California has one figured out a lot of this stuff out, so it depends on like if it's contractual. It is contractual, but can you get out of it? What's the penalty that you like that? Anybody else?
inventory once every 12 years, but what you'd probably do is do like a subset of plots every three years, just so you're not waiting to that 12 year. You're basically calibrate your model, your growth model. Um, and then it has to be verified every six years on site, and then every year they have to do a desk review. So it really receives like a, a look over every year, and then every six years, and then tens. You're saying you, that um, for like biomass harvesting, basically well, cut more, well, and then I, you're I, saying encourage regeneration well, because the uptake but, rate, right? Yes, but um, today, much of the residues um, from logging, I start with half a million seedlings per acre by the time the trees are 25 yeah. inches in diameter. There's under 100. Yeah. So I've lost so. 499,900 trees. To, yeah. And so and that has gone into the atmosphere as soon as. Right, but the, those seedlings or the saplings are, are smaller. It's not as much. There's not well, it's true. through but stem exclusion. You're saying they basically die off and de decompose the right. gone. So your uptake rate at the beginning is going to be faster. So maybe you get three metric tons of an acre per year. But if you don't encourage like conservation to store the carbon in the existing forest, then that's a huge sink that already exists. So if we don't pay for that existing stock, we'll have a reversal. We'll have to. Um, the uptake rate basically won't catch up to the existing stock. But, it, but the, the charcoal that you can make from, from this local distributed energy generation and, and retention of charcoal biochar. Like biochar? Yeah, I, I could see that. I think that on the spectrum of research to market is probably more on the research angle. But I think you, if, if we could show that there's a market for it and you could mobilize, access to market is difficult right now. Is this, the, the climate change is going so fast. I think my forest is going to be blown down for a if we don't get to a carbon negative economy. You're saying faster. Yeah. Fast, fast, fast. Yeah. This is, I've been watching this for 25 years and it's just in the Yeah. To the point where I don't manage forests anymore because it's just. You're more concerned with the nature. Right. Why, why, put, why put money on the ground? I just follow up on that. I mean, in this region, we're looking at emerald ash borer, hemlock blue delta, climate change, addition of longhorn beetle. You know, these woods that we value that here probably aren't going to be, uh, it's not a sustainable system in the long run, given what's coming our way. And I wonder what the market risk is of locking yourself into a 100 year contract to store carbon given the ecologically, the forests, I mean, you see in the western United States that. Well over 20% yeah. of the carbon that's gone. Right, right, right. Okay. So, so you can manage for that. So they won't penalize you for managing for risk like that. So you do have a buffer, buff, buffer pool that covers you if there's a fire or a pest disease breakout. And if you want to manage for it, they allow you to do that. So. But it's 20%, and then the, 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 the systemically, that, systemically carbon losses from the northern forest are much greater than 20% because of anthropogenic climate change. It doesn't matter because the, the, the buffer pool covers the whole US. So, anyways, but great modeling exercise and definitely understand the concern. Um, but it's almost like do we, do we just do nothing now then? You know, it's kind of a. Well, I think, I think, maybe, I think maybe the answer is that there's a large business risk of taking this one. Yes. And then that probably this, for this region, that's probably this is probably not rational for the landowners to buy into this. Well, right? especially if you have the, the, the 1,500 acre minimum financial viability, there's not many people in this area that have We'll take, um, how are we doing on time? I think we'll probably move to the next presenter. Thank you very much. Okay, so the, I'm gonna talk about short-lived climate forcers, and which includes black carbon, especially in methane just to get an idea how many people know about the role of short-lived climate forces in black carbon and climate change. Okay, so 
about half and half. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that first before I talk about ACAR uh, and our strategy, which kind of fits into the story that we just heard during lunchtime is what do we do about it? What can we do now? And I think this is kind of a project that uh, has been developed to deal with that. So um, I'm adding a twist to the short-lived climate enforcers in the sense that I've been working with uh, persistent organic pollutants, dioxins, PCBs, pesticides, PAHs, all these toxics that were very fashionable to look at in the 70s and 80s and disappeared about the time of the Bush administration, <laughs> coincidentally. Um, and I was um, going to also do another session, which I canceled the panel for this conference, but the other panelists couldn't make it um, from other countries uh, to pay tribute to my director, uh, Barry Comner. I worked for him for about 10 years. Uh, he was called a scientist activist. In his early days, um, when his first work was radioactive fallout, where he collected the heat <coughs> and measured radio, um, uh, tracers of radioactivity in baby teeth to document that this was a problem. Um, then, uh, in 1994, uh, I got on board with his uh, shop, and I'm trained in economics and environmental science, uh, especially chemistry. And the commonality I have between the fields is computer modeling. And on the side there, you see some work that we started in 1994. Um, when I joined Barry Conner, and this was an atmospheric transfer word with gas. So this is how I came into this subject matter, my own story. Um, actually, we first looked at uh, the Great Lakes, and EPA tried to model docks in, to the, um, in the U.S. and Canada and failed. So they assumed we made up everything. <laughs> and our results were, you know, Where'd you come with this? Nobody in the world has been able to do this because dioxin is a semi-volatile compound. It goes from vapor phase to particulate phase. Um, and it travels through the atmosphere and gets into the food supplies. So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes on what we did with um, air transport. Um, Mark Cohen basically adapted a model for real that was designed for radioactive fallout from NOAA for organic pollutants. And we did the work with Great Lakes, and he did such a good job. I hired him at NOAA, and we continue to collaborate. So even though Barry would have been an outlier a few years ago in the ecological economics, in the sense that he believes the problems that we're facing lies in the decisions being made at the point of production. Okay? Uh, he came, so comes in as a biologist, plant scientist, with all this history going back to the 50s of environmental problems, and it says basically the problem is how are decisions made at the point of production. Now some people say that now, of course, our economic system just isn't working. So basically what we did is uh, we simulate an atmosphere, uh, in this case, dioxin transport um, from uh, North America, and we did about seven communities for Nunavut um, uh, emerging New national, uh, new territory, uh, rather, a new uh, uh, unit, political unit in Canada, not quite a territory, not quite a province, uh, where the majority of the people are Inuits. So when you measure the efficiency of transport to the hunting and fishing grounds of uh, to that island, Rotten Island, uh, we take the emission inventory of dioxins, multiply this by this. And then we get the contribution to the um, deposition to Broughton Island. So we were doing this work, and we started finding out certain things about air transport to the Arctic, which would become key to this new exercise of global warming, black carbon, and the Arctic. Um, as an example, we were policy driven, and we had identified individual sources that were the main contributors to dioxin contamination of this particular community. And by pointing fingers like this and listing them, a lot of political pressure was put on these sources. So these, are, these sources, even though there's tens of thousands of sources in North America, 
these 30, in this case, 39 sources account for 35% of the docks in that one community. So that means we can target and reduce docks and loading. Our original work was to build, cut docks and loadings to the Great Lakes by 50%. And this study, and we're contracted by the North American Commission of Environmental Cooperation, which means government can't work sometimes. This is the NAFTA side accords. And most of these facilities are not polluting at anywhere near these levels. In fact, most of them are shut down or have advanced pollution control equipment. And basically, it helped bring forward uh, US Canadian policy that brought this about. So it makes sense to target. And that's where we get into climate change. It seems overwhelming with CO2, carbon, and all these different things are causing climate change. Where should we put our priority? Uh, now, one of the things we have come up with certain scientific uh, findings through this is that the variability of the transport to the Arctic is varies by season and month. So these are the quantities, 0 0.02 uh, July hypograms. Uh, per square meter, and then much heavier down here, 1.49 in May. So there's the seasonality. And what I'm getting at is that in the Arctic, as some of you know, we already have global warming. It's very hot. I'll get some slides to that sooner. So in the Arctic and the polar regions are becoming a source of global warming for the mid-latitudes. There's positive feedback effects in the Arctic. So what we're after now is to target the Arctic uh, to decrease the um, um, climate change effects. This is some, of, again, the early work. This is 99-2000, contribution by country to the contamination of the different communities. So I think this is a good example of putting together economics, identifying sources, the economic feasibility of reducing um, the pollution of those sources, uh, science, uh, the best science we can put into a model, and uh, resulting in policy. And we did work directly with the Inuit communities. And this gives us a relationship of emission and deposition. So as you notice, as you're closer distance from source to receptor, the deposition is higher than its emission. Uh, but strength of emission is uh, important. So in the northernmost receptor in Arctic Bay, uh, uh, transport still does occur. But it's a key thing that we're finding that we're going to translate into black carbon, that if we reduce the uh, toxics, those rather the black carbon short-lived climate forces closest to the Arctic, we'll have the maximum effect uh, in slow global warming. So my beginning of this work like I said, it was with Center for Biology and Natural Assistance at Queens College. Um, because of that work, I was put on a task force of the UN Economic Commission of Europe, uh, the Convention for the Long Range Transport of Air Pollutants, LERTAP. And we did an assessment of uh, POPs in the Arctic, but we also, my colleagues also did an assessment of aerosols, including black carbon and PM, for the particular matter of ozone. And this work was started in 2009, but at that time we didn't know that black carbon was going to be so important. So um, there's another storyline that I'm bringing out here, and this is international collaboration. This is key for all this happening. Despite all the problems, it's very easy to say this cannot happen, governments will not do that. There are ways to do this. Uh, my primary co-authors here are from uh, Environment Canada, Germany, um, and Russia, and Sweden, and um, Switzerland. Um, so it can happen. And uh, I'd like to mention something that Terry Keating, our co-chair from EPA, said in our next round after we finish this project. It says it's an assessment of what we knew as of 2010, but one lesson is never put a year in the title. It didn't come out to June 2011. Uh, but he said, what do we do next? He says, I want you to not deal with these current policy debates. He says, I want you to think about what kind of science and what kind of collaborations are going to be needed five to 10 years from now, and then let's start doing the science. So uh, let's let science lead instead of follow the policy debates. Now, here's my third influence. 
Um, the University Center in Svalbard, um, because of this work I've done, I'm a guest lecturer up there in the Department of Environmental and Technology. And just a few weeks ago, a reindeer was outside my window, and I was backcountry skiing up in the glaciers. But probably more importantly, my students here and my other guest lecturers, Heidi Dearson and Ali Khan, are um, taking measurements of the albedo of the snow, the reflectivity of the snow. As you probably know, the black carbon reduces the re reflectivity of the snow, which gives a higher temperature, advances snow war uh, warming. There's a high degree of uncertainty of how much black carbon is actually causing this. So we need more measurements, and um, Aliyah Khan is at um, uh, University of Colorado Boulder, and Heidi Dearson is um, at uh, University of Connecticut Oceanographer. And, um, and then you see that included in the scientific equipment is something a little different. Uh, at Eunice, um, where we have a population in Svalbard of 2,500 people and 3,000 polar bears. Five minutes? Okay. Uh, so uh, I want to mention this as well because uh, the University Center at Svalbard has undergraduate, master's, and PhD classes. And um, tuition is free for Norwegians and foreigners. Who, um, so it's a good place to send students for hands-on research credits. The condition is, is that your college has to accept those credits for um, transfer. So now I'm going to go rapidly through. This is where Svalbard is. Uh, but you can fly in on a commercial airline, which makes it one of the most accessible Arctic research. Short-lived climate forces. One estimate that we quoted in our book was that um, uh, the short-lived climate forces may have contributed as, as much as 50-55% of the climate forcing since 1750. That's on the high end. But clearly it's something that has been not looked at as much as it should. Here's an indication why one gram of black carbon emitted is equivalent of 1,500 watts or a small heater in the atmosphere for one week, whereas uh, one kilogram of CO2 is like one small ball for 100 years. Okay, so think of that difference. Um, if we take black carbon <coughs> out of the atmosphere today, in two weeks most of it is not up there. You take the CO2, stop emitting CO2, it's still up there for another 100 years. So if we take out black carbon really quickly, we can show slow global warming very quickly. Now what I'm really after is the co-benefits, because it expands our constituency. Uh, these uh, black carbon aggregates, you see, they're very messy, large particles in the air. Um, those pollutants that I've been working on for a long time that um, the, our government is, is less interested in now, dioxins, pHs, uh, bromidate flying retardants, they get destroyed in sunlight. But when they attach themselves to a particle like this, they're shielded from the sunlight and they can travel to the Arctic and elsewhere. So basically, the chemicals that are in our food supply, the neurotoxins, endocrine disruptors, and cancer causing, um, are traveling and they hitch rides on black carbon. The other co-benefits, um, environmental and public health, air pollution kills, agricultural crop yields, ecosystem. Um, there's a lot of activities right now. Here's another key graph. It's, it shows how we can, sh uh, if we do um, do, uh, this is methane and black carbon, you can see that within a very short time we'll have observable differences up here. On the reference is business as usual, um, climate change, if we do black carbon and uh, methane measures, we're way down here. And if we do both, we've dramatically changed our global warming. And the impacts of global warming are pretty severe right now. Um, I'd have to skip through this. This is, uh, this is the uncertainty because the complication of black carbon is um, global cooling also gets co-emitted from these same sources. But this work is done uh, by a group led by Tammy Gold that was just published in January. And it's, um, it shows the probability distribution estimates of the uncertainties. 
And um, I'm going to skip through. These are some of the sources, historic. Uh, I'm going to get into uh, it, This is the other problem is in the Arctic is this contested terrain. Economic development uh, is happening. Um, there's possibilities of conflict. Um, the rush to the resources. We're at a tipping point in the Arctic with permafrost coastal erosion. And you can see here is the temperature changes. Uh, the Arctic is already, by looking at the Arctic, you can see what's going to be happening here 20, 30 years from now, just by going out there today. This is the project I'm on a steering committee of uh, ACAR. Um, we had, we're developing a climate action registry to incentivize reductions of emissions and certify projects for the an new ANSI standard. And our partners, uh, CS CSC, is uh, part of developing those standards, which is parsing out the climate impacts on the Arctic within the standards. Um, so we can offer the third parties certification and um, the main participants. Basically why I'm trying to advertise this is uh, and end here is that um, um, this is an opportunity for scientists, educators to come together to generate projects um, uh, that can reduce climate change in the near term in um, the Arctic. So the general lessons are international collaborations work. Uh, we have a project, SCS Global is our for-profit partner. And some of these slides is from a presentation will be at Columbia University in a few days. Uh, this is a great study, anyone that wants a listing of uh, a listing of the studies and papers. There's a very good assessment. The other interesting part of the story is within a very few years, a lot of international groups did a tremendous amount of science and reduced the uncertainty. And it's a uh, kind of a legacy of the Long Range Transport of Air Pollutants Convention. It started with acid rain, and one of the ad hoc meetings. Somebody raised their hand and says, you know, we don't have any economists part of the task force. And somebody says, well, we've contracted out all the economic cost calculations. He says, well, shouldn't we have somebody here? And then a whole bunch of people raise their hands. He says, no, that's why we've been successful. Because <laughs> economists always tell you you can't do anything. <laughs> so I'm hoping you're a different type of economist. Um, and I'll end here. And also, if you're interested uh, for a friend, a colleague, he's doing a study on eco-literacy, and he wants uh, me to line up people to interview ecologically economists. It's kind of a different sort of baseline for his eco-literacy project. So if you're interested in that, it'll be an hour, hour and a half interview um, in the next few months. Thank you. to keep on time, we have one or two questions, then we'll move on to the next presenter. Why carbon versus methane? It seemed that they were both the same. I couldn't quite make up the thing. Was black carbon much worse than methane? Or black carbon is, um, in total, I think it's um, per pound. I don't actually. I can't. I would, I would make a mistake right now. No problem. Um, and I could get back to you on that. But methane stays in the atmosphere much longer. And the black carbon is the sources of that are. Um, like indoor cooking, um, almost every combustion source. One of the biggest ones is affects is airlines and uh, stratosphere. Forest fires are big, so one of the projects would be to decrease forest fires. Smoking. Huh? Smoking. <laughs> so did you say there were all No, actually, okay, um, there's the LERTAF treaties, conventional long-range transport air pollutants. There's a Gothenburg protocol, which black carbon was added to because of this work of our colleagues uh, just recently. And then there's a separate treaty on, uh, rather, convention on persistent organic pollutants, the Stockholm Convention, the UNEP. But the U.S. has not ratified any of these. And, um, but there is 
international agreement of sorts. The problem is in the U.S. Um, there's been a decline of this as an interest, and uh, Obama hasn't revived that interest. Um, probably one. Just we did one last question, and then we'll walk. You didn't say anything about the unpredictable episodic releases of methane Right. That's that's one reason why the Arctic has these huge positive feedbacks: the melting of the permafrost, the release of methane. So if we can slow the Arctic global warming. The more we slow it, the more we slow global warming. It's still going to happen, but by slowing it, we have more time to adapt. It's not going to stop it. We don't have much time. No, we don't have much time. Time is running out. Thank you, Paul. reduction by 2020. 
and actually both uh, the UK and, and especially Scotland are well on track with this high targets, high um, stated targets. And uh, the role of forests is of course um, um, coming up through the maintenance and decreasing of existing carbon pools, especially this is the case in Scotland and on margin on margin or remote rural areas. And um, then particularly in Scotland, again, uh, high targets uh, were put forward for reforestation. Uh, the target now, currently, Scotland has 17% uh, of wooded cover with the EU, or with the UK, on average 12%. Uh, so it's higher than, than in England, let's say. But uh, uh, the target has been put forward to uh, bring up uh, wooded cover to 25%. Then, um, as usually it, it is the case in Scotland and the UK, the consultation uh, went on and um, been advised by the public. Uh, this uh, target of 25% of um, wooded cover in Scotland has been made an um, aspiration. But anyway, 10,000 uh, hectares of uh, woodlands are to be planted in Scotland each year, which is really uh, a very high uh, target, a very ambitious, I would say. And um, as well, with the short rotation, tree plantations um, are being developed, and um, uh, wood, using wood for fuel and using wood for wood products are being increasingly recognized as considered that then the growing forest would um, sequester carbon so, uh, by its growth and then we can uh, use um, wood to, to substitute fossil fuels or um, carbon intensive materials in construction for instance industry so it's considered to be uh, very um, first priority areas uh, in uh, forest policy uh, concerning climate change in Scotland and the UK. And of course, starting from 1980s, uh, approximately, and, uh, we published an interesting, uh, a highly uh, um, uh, cited uh, um, journal paper in rural, uh, Journal of Rural Studies on post-productive development of uh, um, of the UK forestry. Uh, of course, multifunctional forestry is recognized and there is quite some evidence on the ground in policy and perceptions uh, and there is empirical evidence that uh, forestry is moving towards more and more multifunctional priorities with the national, after the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the National Ecosystem Ecosystem Ecosystem, ecosystem Assessment <laughs> Uh, was uh, published, uh, uh, and uh, we know all these uh, multiple functions and ecosystem services the forest provide. Uh, with the carbon forestry is just one of the components. So we see forestry um, in a holistic way as a component of uh, multifunctional land use systems, multiple functional landscapes, and also we acknowledge all the services that forests uh, in Scotland and the UK provide to the people and society. But our studies, uh, study on forest and climate change went beyond in the UK, actually because um, uh, prior, prior joining uh, the James Cotton Institute uh, in 2002, I, um, over the decade, I worked in Netherlands, so I brought on in experience from the University of Wageningen and, and Amsterdam University and uh, the Dutch focus was in our, has been in our studies since then and also as I'm originally from, from Ukraine, I have an Ukrainian origin, uh, uh, my own interest which has become gradually the interest of the group has been also the, fo the focus, uh, the focusing on Ukraine, and Slovakia, and other Central and, and East European studies. The most so that, as it appeared, um, uh, carbon uh, using forestry in these uh, countries um, is more for 
climate change mitigation of, of, of carbon sink is more uh, economically efficient than elsewhere in, 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 in Europe. So we analyzed several scenarios, and for different countries, uh, these scenarios were different. We analyzed a forestation scenario only for, for the UK, and uh, uh, you know, for the UK, Ukraine, and Slovakia. Then we, uh, for the Ukraine and Slovakia, in addition, we analyzed the renewable energy scenario, and wood products and multifunctional forestry scenarios were analyzed only for, for Ukraine. Coming back to the UK, you see uh, uh, how immense is the carbon storage in uh, vegetation, but not only in vegetation. What is important for Scotland is soil carbon, actually. And uh, in some areas of, of Scotland, soil, soil carbon is really immense. So on the one hand, there is a need to plant 10,000 hectares of woodlands each year, and on the other hand, restoration of beacons is a, a, a very uh, important target. Those are huge numbers, the right. Pardon? Those are huge numbers. Huge, huge, huge numbers, numbers. Uh -huh. for, for soils. Uh, so the straight of beetlands or, or forests, and what, so uh, quite something to explore for, for our scientists. We tried to to simulate mitigation potential, um, and you see that uh, forestry provides some 3 million ton of carbon per year, which uh, allows to set three, roughly 3 million cars, or emissions from 3 million cars, or 3 percent of, of um, carbon equivalent emissions in the UK. So the huge potential in this country and elsewhere in Europe to, um, to sequester carbon, but could it be done in a most cost-efficient way and also in the way which is acceptable and desirable for people because not all of us would like to see short uh, plantations in the near neighborhood. So uh, uh, the study went into three or four main, main directions. First of all, we analyzed cost-efficiency of carbon, uh, much in elevation costs like shown shown by a chance um, for different countries under different scenarios and, and played with different uh, um, management regimes, etc. Then uh, we analyzed also policies, institutions, and public attitudes and perceptions about various scenarios and policy measures. Uh, for instance, for the UK, you can see that there is a, 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 a very wide, a broad discrepancy. So, on the one hand, if land was used for wheat, it's definitely not reasonable to plant trees on, on such a land. But for some, uh, for, for some land used, uh, not non-intensively used, um, sheep, uh, sheep grazing, where of course are uh, Roughly 30, uh, uh, 30 um, uh, pounds per ton of carbon, not CO2. Then uh, it appeared to be quite rational. And uh, so selected observations were that it's very, very case specific. In different regions, uh, of course, in different countries, uh, there are different opportunities. And in some areas, like in Scotland, when we plant seed cross crews with um, high growth rates and depending also on management regime, it could be a good opportunity, most effective, efficient, and feasible and acceptable for some communities. But um, on the other hand, uh, to compare with, for instance, uh, carbon efficiency, efficiency of carbon sequestration uh, in trees in Ukraine, where costs appear to be 9.5 on average um, euros uh, per ton of carbon, then we could argue that maybe by using international agreements and arrangements and planting trees in Ukraine rather than in, um, in Britain would be a better opportunity. We also uh, analyzed this for Slovakia. Um, as I told, so net present value benefits. But we, we are very keen and we have come for in Ukraine um, by looking in addition to carbon to other ecosystem services. Mm. I am I, given a sign that I have to, uh, to complete my
my talk, but I would like to say that a lot is, is yet to be done, and not only on mitigation side, but also on adaptation. And also on uncertainties also uh, was mentioned the, the role and the, the necessity of doing research on uncertainties and risks pertaining <coughs> also to carbon sequestration to forests. And just to advertise our work, uh, you can see that we work on how to different countries respond to, to international agreements on opportunities and challenges of carbon of setting and marketing, then on afforestation for provision of for provision multiple ecosystem services, then analysis of forest plantations to mitigate climate change. Uh, all, all these papers, uh, recent, most recent papers in a couple of years, are available, some of them with me, so I can uh, give you. We all have also started to work on adaptation, and we went well, even beyond the transition countries to developing countries. So just a brand new paper published in the Annals of Forest Science on application of carbon forestry programs on local delivery foods and leakage uh, the case of uh, Mexico. And also the case of South and Southeast Asia were analyzed under the uh, CDM. This is probably because in addition to this funding, just to advertise a bit, uh, the James Cotton Web, we are going uh, beyond and applying very intensively and successfully to the European Commission. And we have just finished um, the EU funded project, uh, Red Alert, reducing deforestation in the tropics, um, which was a real success. And we also lead on to current EU post actions. It's ECOS on forest and climate change, huge project. Involving 30, 30 European organizations, 28 European and a couple of, uh, from elsewhere, and um, for the newest action, Sense4. By the way, Sense4 is on enhancing sensitivity and resilience of um, ecosystem services to climate change, and um, this is an open call. Uh, participants from from uh, Europe. Yes, and uh, North America more generally, elsewhere in the world, could join us, but funding will not come to this organization, it would be self-funded, but coming for the meetings, of course, would be supported from the European Commission. So if you are keen uh, to join, we can talk, this is a sense for uh, project. But also, we have projects uh, within the UK, and some of them are very Practical. So, together with the European uh, uh, Forestry Institute in Finland, for instance, we are producing under uh, the target thin forest. We are producing policy and decision makers uh, recommendations on forest biomass for Europe. What science can tell us? So, this probably <laughs> for, for Charles not to be too angry. I will stop. No. Thank you. <laughs> about those peat lands. And if I understand correctly, the carbon storage of the peat lands is about 100 kilograms per meter squared. And, and that has to be something that's, that's at risk with climate change and the increased disturbance. What we're seeing actually in the northern forests is evidence that when you harvest trees, then that actually leads to long-term loss of mineral soil carbon, which is a major effect. Um, and I'm wondering kind of what your group is doing to look at how to conserve soil carbon actually. It's both the trees Sense? Yeah, it, it, I, I think it's very actually a case depending on soils, depending um, soil carbon is very, uh, we have recently some really strong discussion with Finnish guys, uh, they, uh, they think that planting trees is better, uh, depending on what uh, time scale we consider, um, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the horizon of, of our study. So, uh, uh, but to a large extent depends on, on what type of soils, how deep they are, what type of soil. But in, for Scotland, uh, soils is like like a precious, 
the, the, with trying to conserve soil because they really store huge, huge amount of carbon. But sometimes some projects are controversial. I would rather not be not agree with projects which were if forests were planted in the early 90s, for instance, on these peatlands, and now they are. Uh, trees are cut down and now peatlands, uh, uh, try, uh, we try to restore these peatlands. I, I, I would rather not be doing this, uh, but, but <laughs> we are to a large extent policy driven and, and trying to. So we'll take one more question if there is one. I have a question about your carbon accounting for biomass energy use and whether your baseline is assuming that there's no forest so that you're actually crediting um, planting forest and sequestering carbon before it's combusted? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, mm, no forest, is, is, <laughs> the assumption was made either just bare land, like marginal land, so no. Mm, no foreign income, uh, I mean, or agricultural land, and then we can't what, uh, so we make more precise calculations of opportunity, the opportunity cost. So it's new plantation. First thing I need to do is to give a shout out to uh, the NSF funded uh, New Hampshire F-Score program, which is a consortium of, I think, pretty much every college and university in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, they're the ones who provide the funding for our work. And our, uh, our team is part of the Robin Collier team. And as you can imply from the title, what I'm going to talk about is a part of, the part of our, our work is a what if study. What if? U.S. Forest Service actually included carbon sequestration as part of and the management of the U.S. National Forest. A little background first. Our work is based upon a, a study in 2007 by Rich Howard, who's sitting, uh, our PI, who's sitting in the front row over here, and then research fellow John Gutrich, which they developed a relatively simple integrated forest ecology uh, economics model. Uh, in which net present value of timber was calculated via, again, a relatively simple growth and yield mock, uh, equation in which uh, the stand volume is a function of stand age and a timber revenue equation which incorporates these stumpage prices for different species, the proportion of uh, saw logs and poles for different uh, forest types. Put that together, add in a, a discount rate, and you get and sum it over uh, centuries in this case, and you get a net present value for timber. You also have a net present value for carbon, which we start off with a uh, life cycle analysis of the carbon stream as it flows into uh, different wood products, whether they be paper, whether they be veneer, what have you. That then feeds into this longer sort of carbon storage, carbon budgeting equation in which the carbon of live trees, dead trees, soil is combined with the carbon in the wood products. That then feeds into an equation where we add the magic touch of the uh, social cost of carbon, which I'll come back to in a little while, sum it over again over centuries, decades, centuries, whatever the time of life it is, and you get your net present value of carbon. So the purpose of the study was to compare the management of a northeastern forest with or without net present value of carbon. And there's a lot of uh, advantages pros, I'd say, to the model. One is that it integrated timber revenue and economic benefit of carbon sequestration. And it did so for a specific region. The parameters, parameters that were used were for northeastern forests um, as close to New Hampshire as possible. And it also, and while the specific purpose of the model was to find an optimal rotation period for clear cut of, uh, northern, of various forest types in the northern forest. They also compared that to one very realistic, uneven, or selective harvest strategy that's actually used by private landowners in New Hampshire. And it has relatively simple with, with uh, some realistic assumptions. 
But even though Rich is here, we're quite, I will say that there are some cons to the model too. It wasn't perfect, sorry. It is a stand level only model. Essentially, they looked at was five hypothetical stands, each of a different force, one hectare stands, each of a different force type. And you would commonly see in the, over the forest, spruce fir, aspen birch, beech, uh, maybe beech birch, and something else, and pine. It considers only two ecosystem services. Not bad, but still it's a timber revenue and carbon storage. As I said, basically you have an optimal rotation period for clear cut versus one selective uh, forest management strategy. That's not all the different types of forest strategies, forest management strategies, harvest treatments that are used in the North Fork, you know, private land, but certainly not on public land. And it does not consider albedo. I won't consider albedo either. Hopefully some of you made it to, we have Dave Lutz, another member of our team sitting in the second row there, who gave a talk this morning on his work incorporating albedo as an ecosystem service into forest management. So, that's the background. But the function of dance work is it makes a big difference in the system. Yeah. So, you know, I can actually turn it over to you. <laughs> but, what I would say, probably interrupt you. Yeah, I'm the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> So, now, now okay, as I say, this is really a, uh, it, it is a what if scenario. What if the Forest Service, the U.S. Forest Service, actually cared about carbon sequestration? And we'll talk about whether they are trying to care about that. But let, let's assume, for the sake of this study, that they are. And I have a background in ecology and law, so I'm going to go into law. Well, it's not just because I have a background in law, it's because I'm talking about U.S. public lands. U.S. public lands as opposed to private forest lands are managed to a large degree under statutory and policy constraints and requirements. And there's several laws that are involved. I'm only going to talk about three of the big ones. MUSI, and lawyers like a lot of other people love their acronyms. So we have the Multiple Use and Sustained Yield Act of 1960, which covers all sorts of uh, multiple use lands, not national parks, not wildlife refuges but things like rangelands and national forests. And it is here in 1960 that Congress actually explicitly laid out the kinds of multiple uses that for the U.S. Forest Service must consider when they manage a national forest. And from now on, I am going to equate these multiple uses with ecosystem services. And we can debate better later about whether I'm right to do that or not, but uh, I'm going to do that. And I'm also going to say that they had no idea when they actually wrote this about what ecosystem service was in 1960. And Congress might not have any very much idea about it. <laughs> <laughs> Another law, National Forest Management Act, NIMFMA. It's specific to the U.S. national forest. Two, two things, two takeaway messages from here. One is that it requires the Forest Service to develop management plans for forests. They can't just manage it in a really, really way. They actually have to sit down and create a plan every 10 or 15 years, revise it as necessary, that actually incorporates all of those same multiple uses or ecosystem services into the plan. This is a, it's a major requirement. It's a major change in how the U.S. Forest Service is so required to manage lands. Another law, the final one, NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, big law covers every sort of major federal action, not just forest management. But the creation of a forest management plan is considered a major federal action. So that means that the U.S. Forest Service has to develop environmental impact statements that considers the impact of the forest management plan on economics, on uh, social aspects, on the environment. And they must include a range of reasonable alternatives to them. That's important. Because it actually creates a range of reasonable scenarios that we can then use in our study to say, well, what if they, if they hadn't chose the plan that they're using now, if they chose something else, what would that something else be? Well, the Forest Service has already done the work for us. And one of those alternatives must be a no action alternative. That doesn't mean a hands off management. That doesn't mean no timber. That's a status quo sort of. That's basically saying that we're going to keep on managing the forest as we've done previously prior to the management plan. So if we've been heavy harvest, 
Before we develop this plan, are no action alternative would mean that we're going to keep on doing that part of this. So, White Mountain National Forest, how do they manage ecosystem services? First thing they do is they, they create pretty pictures with lots of colors on them. And all of those are actually different, various management areas with different sort of requirements, different sort of uh, uh, management going on in them. Two biggies right here, this is the White Mountain National Forest in Hampshire, is the light green that you see is the general management area. That's where all the timber harvesting goes on. The purple, or lavender, I guess it is, sort of in the middle, that's wilderness area. No timber harvesting, no roads. The rest of it is various sort of recreational areas where you can ride your ATV or have a campsite. Uh, there's some experimental forests in there as well. You see the two biggies are the wilderness area and the general management area. It's the general management area, that greenish area, is where all the timber harvesting goes on. So that's the first thing they do. Let's divide up the forest into the different management areas. Then let's do a cost-benefit analysis. Well, the Forest Service, and their when they create a management plan, they're only going to look at two variables when they actually do a cost-benefit analysis, which is actually required in their regulations, so they have to do this. But they're only going to do it for things that have a market value, the timber harvest, the timber recreation, and the things that they can assign values for, recreation. So they look at the cost-benefit for the, for the plan and for the various alternatives. But they do consider other ecosystem services, biodiversity, watershed protection. They don't give them values. What they do is that they do a, uh, essentially use them as constraints. If they have decided a priority that a particular area, a particular habitat, which, it, which might have very high quality uh, hardwood that, would, that uh, timber, you know, logging people would love to cut down. But if that happens to be a, a very important habitat for a particular endangered species or any sort of other uh, species of interest, they won't, they won't cut it. It will be, it will be set aside. It will be part of the plan that this is going to be preserved for habitat. So that's essentially how biodiversity and watershed protection, watershed protection is that they'll decide that we're not going to cut a certain number of, uh, you know, a certain number of uh, meters from a river or stream. And basically, so then, sort of summing up, what the laws require is a, an actually a uh, balancing of various ecosystem services, with, and that's what the statutory required. But it's only recently that the Forest Service has even started the consideration of carbon in their management plan. And if we have time at the end, I'll talk about why, legally speaking, it might be very difficult for them to actually get away with including carbon sequestration as a uh, ecosystem service in the management plan. I have a time up here too, so uh, well, I'll, I'll rush. I always put more and say, oh, I couldn't cut this, I couldn't cut this, but uh, I, will, I will speed through some of this stuff here. Uh, so what we want to do, basically we're looking at White Mountain National Forest, compare its total net present value with and without uh, the net present value for carbon. I'm going to do that for the 2005 management plan. Do it for the, uh, the other three alternatives that they use to compare it to, and do it for our own no harvest alternative. What happens if they really did take a hands-off approach? Objectives: take that model, that stand-level model, and blow it up to a regional-level model. Let's see what the net present value, not of just a one-hectare stand, is going to be, but of an entire managed region and to do it for a very specific area with parameters that are, that are defined for the White Mountain National Forest so that it can be used to answer regional specific questions. Uh, this just shows basically, as far as logging is concerned, alternative two is the actual management plan that they're using now. I just want to throw that in there so you have an idea of where it fits in with the other uh, sort of uh, alternatives. Now basically, the take-home message you see here is that they did not take, the Forest Service did not pick the alternative that produces the most timber harvest, that produces the most uh, timber cutting, that produces even the most uneven regeneration cut. The only thing that alternative to the plan, the actual plan ranks first in, is it the proportion of saw timber versus a pole. What, what, what's the prescription? Excuse me? What's the prescription that came for, for that ranking by saw and pole? Prescription? 50 yeah. meters, I think. Right? Yeah, as part of your prescription for harvesting. All the other ones you have, uneven age, uneven oh. age, thinning. I'm just curious why that one kind of I can save it to the end. 
Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just curious. Are you, are you looking at this one? The, the one that they chose to saw a lot of foam. Oh! It's just, for, it just for the ratio of the amount of saw timber that they It's like 55% saw timber versus 25% foam. It's just a, a raw proportion. And this is important. one of the other so big goals for the forest plan and the alternatives is that they want it to create a new type of forest. The White Mountain National Forest, like a lot of forests in the east, were he was heavily forested in the early 1900s. Uh, a lot of the spruce fir forest that is naturally there was cut back, turned into hardwood or mixed wood, mixed wood of spruce fir and hardwood. The goal of all four alternatives is to increase the amount of spruce fir forest to decrease the amount of mixed wood forest, which is actually all on ecological lands that would normally, you would only see spruce fir. And to also expand the range of the age, age classes. Right now, it's a very mature forest right now, the natural forest. There's very few young and generative age classes. All the alternatives, this more so than others, but all the alternatives tend to desire through use of their cutting methods to actually produce more young regeneration age classes as habitat for those species that we can uh, like those. So I will, the only thing I'll mention about this, for those who are interested, social cost of carbon. In our model, what we use is numbers from the Interagency Working Group 2010. They just got new numbers now, but this is from, we use this because this is what the uh, agencies are, uh, this is what agencies are recommended to use as far as carbon values when they're actually making regulatory decisions. So we use a low value and a high value. So for data, I can wrap up like two minutes, maybe. Uh, this is stand level. Take home message here. The black is timber revenue. These are carbon value. These are carbon MPVs. Red is low with a low social cost of carbon. Green is with high social cost of carbon. This is initial stand age. All this tells you is that the older the stand is when you start your management, the more value, the more NPV you're going to capture for timber, not surprisingly, because you have mature forest, but much lower value you get for carbon. This is important, going back to that other slide, because the White House National Forest is a old forest. The average age of stands is 80, which for hardwood is actually already into the negative carbon values. True also for spruce fir, uh, they're, they're not as good wood, so you don't get as much timber value, say for and birch. Uh, similar for selective uneven harvesting. And basically, not quite, although the carbon values aren't quite as negative. They don't get down, you know, if you look at this one, uh, to the other stuff, we don't have quite as much of these trees. And this is just no harvest for us. Again, no big surprise is that as, as uh, the stand is older, the carbon value captured from the drop off the system. I'll skip over that and just say that when you actually expand that then to the regional model, what you have to do is essentially fit all these stand levels and sum up over all these stands using all the constraints of the White Mountain or the Forest Service uses for the White Mountain National Forest and be sure that all your harvesting regimes in your model add up roughly to what the Forest Service plans for the amount of even age and uneven age harvesting. So what do you do? This is for the entire White Mountain National Forest then. This is the actual current plan. This is timber revenue in, in, in millions, 100 million, 2,600 million, 167. Those are totals over there for, for carbon low, carbon high. Uh, take home messages here is that the one that they picked, alternative two actually produces lower timber revenues than two of the alternatives. But we already saw that because they had about three generation harvest and what have you. The no harvest strategy actually, if you assume a high social cost of carbon, is actually competitive with some of the others. And if we're running out of time, I just wanted to show Thank you all. Let's skip that one. We'll show this right here. This is this sort of a take home message here. This is looking at the average, this is breaking down over the entire White Mountain National Forest. This is looking at each stand by forest type for, for uh, management strategy, converting it from spruce, converting it from hardwood to spruce fir, mixed with spruce fir. This is on an average, this is the average stand. 
what you see is obviously not surprisingly because of the value of timber hardwood produces most of the timber revenue. If you look down, it also has to have uh, mixed wood as spruce fir is actually a good source of carbon value, as is of course the no harvest wood. The interesting thing here also though is that some of the some of the things that the White Mountain National at the US Forest Service will do to protect biodiversity, such as creating half wildlife openings down here or converting mixed wood to aspen birch down here actually results in very much a trade-off this negative carbon value. So a lot of what they do to actually preserve biodiversity has a negative impact on capturing carbon values. So there's the conclusion, so I'll just leave it at that. I mean basically public forest is not an optimal. A lot of a lot of economists like managing the trade-off between carbon and timber as an optimal strategy. There's nothing optimal about the forest service. They're not just supposed to they're legally required not to consider optimal. They have to do trade -off. They have to consider car uh, biodiversity and what that is. So it, it is essentially a constrained universe in which they decide about timber harvesting. Oh, and basically, one of the things, most, I'll just leave it at the very end there. Last thing I'll say, most of the litigation, most of the cases that have been brought against the U.S. Forest Service over their management plan have been from either environmental groups who say you're putting, Forest Service, you're putting too much emphasis on timber. Or from timber, or from logging interests who say, Forest Service, you're putting too much, you're putting too much emphasis on biodiversity protection. The problem for the Forest Service is they are statutorily required to actually manage for those explicitly listed ecosystem services that are back there in UC and NIFMA, and carbon's not one of them. So, if they did include that, what would happen? I would say these four important pieces. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> so I'm going to ask the first question. Sure. I, that is a really interesting analysis. Um, the, so, the U.S. Farm Bill included S SEC. I'm surprised that they aren't mandated to include the social cost of carbon uh, U.S. Forest Service. Yeah. Uh, so is it, is it like they, they, if they want to, they can, or they're not mandated? They're not mandated. Not, right. not in the management plan. Uh, they're encouraged. Part, this is their new regulations. So they just came out with a new set of regulations that actually essentially implement the National Forest Management Act. They came out with those in 2012. There's things in those new regulations that encourages the use of, you know, considering carbon, considering the effects of climate change on the forest, and considering the way the forest could mitigate it. So they're being encouraged to do so, that. So they could use it even though it wasn't listed as one of the original. Exactly. Exactly. The Forest Service, I mean, when the forest actually develops a management plan, they have a lot of uh, leeway to okay. do it. See, my last point I was saying though is that what happens when a lot of times this, this is just a, a legal history is that somebody would sue them. Well, environmental is super complicated. Sorry, I've taken the floor. Uh, one more question? Yes, sir? Books to sell here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whose are they? The yearbooks? Okay, that's a question. Yeah. Sure. Did you have a book in there? Yeah. Um, I have two quick questions. The first is um, Is the Forest Service more or less right in their biodiversity protect? Like, I mean, that, that, that those management plants will protect biodiversity? That, that's a big, that's right. a big debate. Then I will make you yeah. go into that. My second question, I think I misunderstood something. Um, you were saying that the no harvest um, sequesters a significant amount of carbon, but then when you were showing your slides of, of ages, um, you were showing that, 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 that older forests, maybe it was older harvesting, I could, I'm not sure, actually have negative uh, carbon sequestration values, right? So you get past 80. Um, eight years old, you're, you're releasing carbon. Could you just explain to me what that actually meant at this event? You see what I'm saying? The one right before that. Yeah, I didn't get what, what, what's going on as those cross zero. Oh, okay. So, so what happened here, this is the initial stand age. This is when you move into a forest and we have to decide to start managing now. We actually have a whole oh. bunch of eight-year-old yeah. stands. I see. So you're cutting, you're cutting old trees here, and then that's going to cut. Okay. So you're going to get a lot of timber revenue. Yeah. But you're also leasing all this carbon yeah. from that's already been sucked up and those trees all over. Yeah. Thank you, you very much. Products and products? Yeah. 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 There's a, I mean, that's sort of out of date, but there is a, there is a uh, 
that's the lithology model yeah. with an LTA model in the background. Yeah, no, if you look at it, like the second slide, I have that. Yeah, yeah. It's all broke down to that one, this one paid little the, equation. This paid for the Bersi. Yeah, the Smith. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, that's something we need to, we need to, yeah, we need, we need to fix up that. We need to update the whole core the topology aspects of how, where all the cards, actually, the soil cards, as we talked about, we know that there's, all, all the stuff, I mean, that stuff that Rich did in 2007, the stuff I'm doing now, is all done. You know, you're still having constant carbon, too. We're all doing it with constant carbon in the soil. So that's the force. But that's supposed to be wrong. It's so. wrong. No, we know that's wrong. We actually have somebody at Dartmouth doing a lot of study about that, showing this huge variation of carbon after forest and stuff. So all of this can really change, especially the soil. Yeah, we're so we're, we are going to wrap up. Sorry, yeah. just oh, because sure. we're at, we have the next, next session. Um, but thank you very much, and thank yeah. you for everybody.